I wanted to be super careful with today's video because of the potentially undeserved reputation that anime fandoms have as being pretty punishing of negative reviews towards their favourite anime. And so I'm going to do my best to be really, really kind with this trans episode. From the story of a superhero who can beat every single thing with a singular punch, which leads to them becoming bored of life and of the gig and... Uh, that's... That's not One Piece? That's One Punch Man. Oh, okay. Well, then, what is One Piece? Monkey D. Luffy, Devil Rora Noah Zero, Straw Hat Pirates, Tony Tony Chopper, Sanji, Not Dragon Ball Z, The Grand and Special Sunscott, Brook, Ninja, Goblin, Revolutionary Army, Sunny. Alright, One Piece is the pirate one, with Monkey D. Luffy and the Straw Hat Pirates as they follow the Grand Line in an attempt to get to the One Piece at the end and become the King of Pirates. A potentially never-ending story that maybe wants you to understand that the journey is more valuable than the destination. Because at a certain point in the commitment, whatever the One Piece might be cannot be so revolutionary that it is still going to be a shock or surprise for the audience who has had so long to theorise it into the dirt. And the trans episode that we are going to be discussing is number 419. God, so close to 420. Or the crewmate's whereabouts, the island of giant birds, and the pink paradise. You might also better know it as the one with the Kamabaka Kingdom, that totally non-toxic fans of One Piece get told about and go... Yeah, that one wasn't the best, really, but trust me, the rest of the show is, is really cool. Look at these pictures of Yamato. Doesn't that prove that it's kind of cool? But we have quabbled and quibbled enough for one day's appeasement of fan bases. Let's actually talk about this trans episode. I Now, most of it is unusable for us, because half of it discusses crewmates on the not-trans island, so it has basically no relevancy, and I will skip that judiciously. There are some references to the prison Impel Down, which is kind of important because of the character Emporio Ivankov, a character that a lot of people wanted me to talk about in more depth. But in reality, this video is already going to get so off track from the One Piece trans episode that I titled it with that I didn't want to spend too much time on that character. The Queen of Kamabaka Kingdom! Oh. 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 Let's just do a paragraph now to attempt to appease the ultimately probably unappeasable people who will think that nothing short of a 50 hour video can truly understand the trans representation of One Piece. Mario Ivankov is the founder of New Kama Land, when they escape from Impel Down, full of Okama who worship him, her, slash them because of his, her, the leadership in helping them get out of prisons, as well as the fact that they share their Emporio female hormones that allow men to turn into women, something that he does on himself, and something that defines a difference between the new karma that he leads now and the old karma from the Kamabaka kingdom who merely cross-dress or dress as women rather than transform into them. Now, the pronouns here are fucking confusing at best, and I want to leave the linguistic paragraph till after the episode itself has played out. That's Emporio Ivankov. They are a queen in more senses of the word than one, and honestly, that is where we can leave them until the conclusion. The episode. Remember the episode that I promised that I would actually fucking review in this stupid bloody video? Begins for us with the narrator telling us that this is Momoiro Island, the island of dreams, where even the fish are a little bit gay, and it features Sanji chasing after a bunch of women on a beach. Oh, 
Now, who is Sanji, you might rightfully be asking. And the easy answer is that Sanji is a member of the Straw Hat Pirates, specifically their cook, and is kind of the hot one of the group. The harder and longer answer would take about 300 volumes of manga to explain, so let's not do that in the interest of saving at least some brevity here. We then flash back in time several hours, to Sanji waking up on a beach, remembering all the stuff that happened which led to him being here, as a woman approaches and asks him if he is alright before he passes out. Sanji wakes up in the lap of this beautiful woman and begins wondering who it could be, because he took quite a blow and might be in some sort of concussion state. And already from this opening, I think you can kind of see the unfortunate joke that the episode is moving towards and is going to spring on the audience. Wherein this character, who thinks they are dealing with beautiful women, discovers somehow that they are actually disgusting men who are merely dressed up like women, and they will then freak out while we in the audience have a good old laugh at their expense, the expense of both Sanji and the cross-dressing men slash or trans women or slash effeminate gay men, because in reality the joke there doesn't care about denoting the differences and lumps them all together for mockery. An attitude that we will discuss further in that linguistics chapter that I'm sure you're really looking forward to. We find out that the mystery girl is called Elizabeth, because she runs away when Sanji touches her and abandons her handkerchief. Sanji then sees that all the animals on the island of Mamoro are just gay as fuck. Like, there are clearly some kind of chemicals in the water that do be turning the freaking frogs gay. Do you understand that? When Sanji goes to return the handkerchief, dreaming of the possibilities that might come from his act of gentlemanness, Elizabeth grabs it from him, barely opening the door, while a bunch of other women hiding behind the trees watch on kind of creepily. Sanji then commits to attempting to convince Elizabeth to see more of him, by saying how he is sorry for being shocked earlier and for shocking her, and that he is a fantastic cook if she maybe wanted him to make some food. <laughs> To which she then begins grilling him on whether he likes western clothing, which I don't quite know what that means, and whether he likes dresses, which I am starting to suspect I might know what that means, and whether he likes floral prints. Okay, I'm back on the train of not having any fucking clue what that means. Sanji, however, takes all of this as a sign of her potential interest, and so responds in a very positive manner towards the idea of dresses and floral prints, imagining more specifically the idea of this woman wearing them than possibly what she might be imagining these questions are related to. Does that make sense? Look, it's all part of that same big trick that is getting played on Sanji from earlier. The trick that is also kind of being played on us, the audience, and the big reveal is surely coming, as Sanji is allowed within Elizabeth's boudoir to try and convince her to, well, I guess make out with him, I suppose. She then rushes at him and throws a dress at him, telling Sanji that he would look great in it. Do you see? Do you see where this video is going now? Where the episode is heading towards, okay? And Sanji notes how strong she is for a woman. 
before seeing her with the rose-tinted goggles of the Dream Island off for the first time. As our initial shot of his shocked reaction pans over to her now hairy, thick legs. Yep. <gasps> this is gonna be one of those episodes. And they do a spin-around reveal on Elizabeth so we can really take in the exaggerated masculinity of the character, really absorb the honestly homophobic and transphobic stereotyping that goes into this one. Broad shoulders, massive chin, facial stubble, a face that will haunt mine and hopefully yours nightmares. It's got all the pieces to really have the audience members grossed out, much like Sanji. <laughs> Even the love hearts that are used when Elizabeth winks coquettishly are now jagged little pills. No, that doesn't work. Look, they have pointy sharp edges. I wanted to kind of turn this into a joke reference to Alanis Morissette, so I could then say that isn't it ironic, don't you think? How Sanji, the womanizing hound dog, gets jump scared by a... something. Can't figure out exactly which offensive slur word I should use here as intended by God, so let's just say filthy dirty queer and hope that covers all my bases. Sanji bursts out of the house, only to discover more of these people each one extremely disturbing and, frankly, an exaggerated expression of a cross-dresser or trans person to such a degree that it would certainly be considered offensive, and I think hard to argue otherwise. <laughs> like, you could cry parody and satire, but parodying what? Satirizing whom? It's just the visual affect of hyperbolic queerness for the intention of reaction. I don't think it has to be deeper than that. Sometimes the bigoted shit is just bigoted shit that an author or writer put into their creation, and I get that it's hard to accept that something you might very well love could do this, but it would be more of a disservice to your fandom to pretend or hand wave away such events. Accept them, process them, and consider what could be done differently in other franchises, and how seeing this might make other fans who are queer feel. Have some goddamn empathy. And the horde of people who surround Sanji, transforming into the scene that I imagine plays in the minds of Matt Walsh every day as what the gays want to happen. <laughs> Well, they now kinda clearly think that he is one of them. That his love for dresses and cooking and floral print, I still don't quite get the floral print one, well, that means that he is an Akama like them, and belongs in the Kamabaka Kingdom, which is what this island is. And as Sanji runs away screaming, the narrator makes his reappearance to tell us how this is the second island of women, and an island of pure pink, as the montage of the animals that were previously also effeminately sexy in a creepy way, honestly, are now also shown to have facial stubble and exaggerated feminine masculinity in a different creepy way. It's all sorts of creepies. How, how does a bird get stubble on its beak, exactly? Just, just out of curiosity. Just personal scientific interest. The narrator tells us though, that all these humans and animals possess a maiden heart, which is actually kind of the nicest thing that has been said this whole time, if you ignore all of the visuals, all of the everything, and just focus on that one particular sentiment. This is sort of okay as a metaphorical representation of 
transness and queerness. Maiden heart is a nice way of putting it. Cling to that life raft as you might wish to. It is sort of annihilated upon the rocky coastline of Sanji running across the beach while a mob of trans-ish characters from Pick Your Right Wing comic chase after him and attempt to force feminize him. <laughs> and there is the parallel here between the Akamas telling him welcome to the crossdresser kingdom or the Kamabaka kingdom because there is some distinction there between that word and that English interpretation and Sanji saying that this is hell. And that's the episode. Now, do I really need to explain why this is a shitty episode for trans or queer or cross-dressing people? Like, I think you are either not a fan of One Piece and kinda see the glaring problems here, you are a fan of One Piece and view this episode as one of the ones that you skip through like it's filler, or you are a fan of One Piece and you just came here to call me a whining tranny who can't take a joke. Either way, in laying out and discussing the episode, I think we kinda saw exactly what I would take issue with and sort of mentioned it already. The Akama are extreme versions of queer people that accentuate all of the aspects that most cause a cis audience, specifically cis men, to react negatively. <laughs> It fills the outline shape of what cis people presume all trans women and cross-dressing men look like with the grossest possible stereotype. It's just one part of a long-standing media tradition to represent us in the most aggressively disgusting fashion that encourages recreations to that form and that demonetizes a whole group into a monolithic grossness. And here is the thing, none of those features, none of those elements are bad inherently. I'm not here saying that if you look like the people from this episode, that you're gross, or that you are not a whatever you identify as, or that you deserve mockery. I am not saying that. But recognizing how cis media uses that image to say that is a different thing to agreeing with it. Now, we could just end here and call it a day, but that would leave me with two worries. The first being that some might come away saying, well, that isn't a trans episode. They said it was the cross-dressing kingdom. Those are just men who dress up like women. Completely different thing to trans women, you foolish fool. And the second, being that people might take this as a denouncement of the entirety of One Piece. As if me saying that this episode is uncomfortable and frankly encourages the kind of perceptions and attitudes that make life harder for queer people is meant to be read as me saying that all of the thousands of volumes and episodes are bad and bigoted. To the first concern that I have, we need to do that linguistic chapter that I promised earlier, and that I'm sure at least one of you has been really excited for me to get to. The major purpose here is to address the concerns in translation between the original Japanese and the English-speaking audience that I represent and that I get my lens through. So I think the biggest thing that people are going to get stuck on here and might take issue with how I refer to this as a transgender episode or transgender representation is that kamabaka, akama, all of these things are commonly used to refer to cross-dressing effeminate gay men. The history of that going back to Edo period Japan, when akama was used to refer to a recipient of anal sex, the root of the word being slightly disputed by different authorities and interpretations, but that was the slang terminology for it at the time. Literally, it means rice pot. But this is like how people use the offensive term faggot to refer to gay people when its literal definition in the past was a bundle of sticks. And we have our own theories for how it ended up getting used in that way that we might be more familiar with right now. Very similar history there, I think, between those two words. Now, this might all seem kind of clear so far. 
pretty straightforward, or not straightforward as it might be. A comma is a reference to the act of anal sex. It is a slur word that was used to refer to effeminate gay men who dressed up as women, transvestites, or drag queens, as we might consider them in a western analogy. So that's that. But much like in the western world too, the slur words that get thrown around for one group of people and the associated notions slash stereotypes of that word quite often do transcend those in-community barriers and can actually be applied to multiple different identities. For example, the offensive slur word tranny can be applied to transgender people, i.e. those who specifically transition gender identity, but it can also be used to refer to transvestites, or those who dress in the clothing associated with the other gender, but don't necessarily transition. A comma gets applied to more than just gay men who cross-dress. It also gets chucked at trans women too, as well as those drag queens I mentioned from earlier, and also just effeminate gay men as well. No womanly clothing required. So in this case, where this word, and kamabaka just means effectively nothing but a karma or full of a karma, what we have to do here is view it under that knowledge that this creator has engaged in the cultural practice of just kinda melding all the queers and the queer identities into one big blob and then applying stereotypes that don't necessarily make sense for individual groups within that. We as an audience have to do the additional work of trying to figure out what the parts presented refer to and are mocking or engaging in hyperbolic exaggeration of. The women of this island present themselves as women. Gross stereotype designed to evoke disgust aside. <laughs> and in the conversation with Sanji, we see this desire to engage in the feminine in a way that puts forth that maiden heart that the narrator refers to. That to me signals ideas that more closely align with transgender identity than with gay men who cross-dress. Ultimately, regardless of all of that, it ain't fucking good. And it's certainly not a comfortable experience. Something which brings me to my second point that I want to make. Can I view one half of an episode and use that to make a judgement upon all of One Piece? Can such a small sample size really be the basis for a critical analysis? No, it kinda can't, but I'm not going to pretend that it is. Ultimately, what I view this as is more of a review of this particular episode, of this one bad moment of trans or trans adjacent identity insertion. I consider it like if you were reading a book you enjoyed, and then midway through there was just a whole page that only had a slur printed on it. And so, Hermione, Ron and Harry all went into government and managed to do basically nothing to change the system whatsoever, finding out that the true evil was maintaining the status quo. What a great gra oh. The next page just says the word tranny on it. Now you can still enjoy that book. The other 999 pages are pretty decent, but that one page might be enough to give you pause or make you question why it's in there, and what that says to you or about the creator. But I want this to be a video that One Piece fans can come away feeling like I wasn't just dogging them in something they love. And so, in the interest of fairness, I'm not going to read or watch the whole thing. I'm sorry, One Piece looks cool and I like pirates, but I just can't. I'm trying to catch up on Doctor Who right now, I don't have the time. What I can do though, is use the new system that I've just invented called the Equilibrium Method. What the fuck is that? Well, basically, I've reviewed what is considered the worst trans representation in the series by the fans that I've talked with. Why not counterbalance that by talking about what those same fans consider the best representation? In doing that, maybe we can find a nice middle point for considering the writings of Ichiro Oda, the guy who created the series. I think it's especially helpful because I cannot find an interview with him about the queer stuff in One Piece anywhere, so 
I mean, my own view on his writing is, is all I have here to judge it off of. So let's talk about not just one character, but two characters. Yamato and Kiku. That's right, I am spoiling the shit out of you today. I could have called this one three pages ago, and yet here we are. Yes! 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 So, who the hell is Yamato? And why are we talking about them? Well, Yamato is a character in the later arcs, i.e. closer to the 1000 mark, who is introduced to us as the child of Kaidu, one of the many antagonists who if I bothered listing the various titles that he has and position that he holds within the narrative, this would be the never-ending recap. But the important thing for us is the fact that Yamato was born as Kaidu's daughter, but due to an extreme fascination with Kazuki Oden, a daimyo, son of the shogun and samurai, they took on Oden's persona to honour them post his death, even referring to themselves as a man and male and the son of Kaidu instead. And this identity refers to even how other characters within the show treat Yamato as well, as Kaidu himself declares that his son will become the new Shogun at the end of episode 994. <laughs> and Luffy, our protagonist, refers to Yamato with male denunciations such as in his nickname for him, Yama-o, which uses the kanji for man after finding out this backstory and important story elements upon Yamato's revelation of his gender identity and story in episode 992. Importantly as well, when a bunch of the characters are going into the bathhouses in episode 1079, Yamato uses the male bathhouse with the rest of the men, with no real issue or notation by the series about that fact. It's just how things are. <laughs> and that note about episode 1079 actually quite nicely leads us into considering Kikunojo, who also appears in that same episode going into the ladies' bathhouse with the rest of the women. Why is that relevant, you might be asking? Well, it's relevant because Kikunojo was born a man, and was referred in legends of the group she belonged to, the Nine Red Scabbards, who are actually retainers and samurai of the Kazuki family that Odin belonged to, and that he actually formed. It's wild that both of the trans characters or trans adjacent characters or trans allegorical characters, because the exact specific details are always a little bit hazy at times, but it's wild that this one dude was connected to both of them. Strange it happened twice. Like, did Odin have some kind of trans safe space aura he gave off to others? Anyway, the Nine Red Scabbards were referred to in reputation as being all men, and Kikunojo was no exception. But as we discover in episode 948, she presents and lives in a traditional feminine manner according to Japanese cultural norms, and sees herself as being a woman at heart, something which is reflected in the way that the series treats her outside of just the narrative, with readers referring to her as a woman, and her vivre card, which is like a data card that was collected in a book for the hundreds and hundreds of characters that fans need to keep up with, so it is kind of justified to do a big data card book and make sense, well, that card refers to her in that regard of her internal sense of self. Her essential self is a woman, not the man that she might be considered as at birth. Now, if that isn't a trans thing, I don't even know what is. And yet again, the narrative and the characters that we see as our protagonists, and even the villains, treat her as this gender. Treat her as a woman with no real long-term fuss or muss. So, what do we do with that information? 
I mean, these two characters definitely paint a far kinder, or at least far more accepting position of trans people, or trans characters that could be seen as being trans enough that the trans community could connect with them. You aren't getting me on a technicality like that one, okay? These characters are trans. I don't care what you say about the odd, oh, but they're not actually trans, they don't use the word transgender. Fuck you! Well, that was kind of the point of bringing them up, wasn't it? The point here was to showcase how just because a creator writes something that employs the worst stereotypes and aggressive insulting portrayals of the trans community, does not mean that they are always going to do that, or that they can't also write these badass characters who are shown to be awesome while also reflecting notions of gender that are not constrained to specific cisgender binary ideas of it. It would have been so easy to consign One Piece to transphobic hell for what they did with the Kamabaka Kingdom, and frankly with also Emporio Ivankov. I really don't like that character, and I just do not care for the new Kama stuff. But that's just me, and a lot of people that do really like Emporio, and that's their prerogative. They're not all the same. We don't all like the same people and the same representation. That's fine. But in reality, I think that Oda has a complex view upon trans people, and on writing trans characters. A view that is perhaps influenced by a society that has a rough history with seeing them. A less than savoury history, like, oh I don't know, pretty much every country everywhere, all of them? Let's face it, there, there aren't that many blameless cultures when it comes to fucking queer people over that are alive today. But Oda's approach to some of these characters, even to Ivankov, is one that I think might be evoked in what my ex-flatmate, who is super into One Piece, said once. Which is that he sees queer people and trans people as freaks and weirdos. But also, he thinks that being a freak or a weirdo is cool as shit. Now, do I think that is really what gets reflected in the work of One Piece? I'm not sure. It's hard to say without knowing the guy. But what I can say is that being trans or being queer doesn't mean you can't find interesting role models or characters to relate to within the long, long arcs of One Piece. In fact, you can find quite a few very gay and very genderfucky people all over the place. I didn't even cover close to the gamut of options, merely what are regarded as the highs and lows. None of that excuses the flaws, but I think it does mean that the experience isn't an entirely negative one. A quite complex answer to the simple question I started this video with, which was just me trying to review the trans episode of One Piece. And honestly, let's face it, a simple answer was never a possibility with a series this long and this full of stuff happening. At the very least, I hope you enjoyed the journey. And enjoying the journey is kind of the message of One Piece when you think about it. On that note, if you have enjoyed this journey, then give me a like, share, subscribe, and comment. If you really liked what I did here, then please comment with your own single sentence summary of One Piece, and the summary must be both concise as well as definitive. Good fucking luck with that one. Otherwise, you can support me on Patreon, Ko-Fi, or here as a member on YouTube if you like the idea of me getting paid for my work. YouTube really does try its best to make sure that I don't get the ability to have an income, and I promised multiple different Patreon goals in a Patreon video a few months back that uh, I'll try and dig up at some point, remember? The, the first one is a Q&A video at $1,000 a month, which I think we've passed, and it will feature questions from you, the audience, favouring questions from those who are paying, of course, first and foremost, because that's capitalism. Money makes the world work in this capitalist hellscape, after all. And I do like eating food and having a roof, so I'm going to favour the people paying. I mean, obviously to watch the videos anyway, so it's all fine, right? With all that said, thank you for watching this video. And I hope you have a great day.